As Land brings up, Claude Levi-Strauss's alliance theory shows how the incest taboo leads to kinship between tribes since the incest taboo prevents them from marrying within their own tribes. Since they need to marry outside their circles, it thus creates an exchange of women, using women much like a commodity. Thus a link between capitalistic practices and dealings with the outside, linked to Kant's concept of noumena. Conversely, it is fascist nation-states and incestuous systems that are typically marked by xenophobia, fear of the other or outside, and thus racism. At the very least, we see the link between capitalism and Kant. So let's continue on a bit more with Kant himself. Now Kant was considered practically a Christian saint for his time, not engaging in earthly pleasures. Thus, what pleasures he attained came from what he termed the sublime, a pleasurable divine feeling attained a priori, or independent of experience, away from the animalistic imagination. It was in this way that Kant pleasured himself, a form of gothic violence, or violence against what he called the imagination, i.e. that which constitutes objects of experiences. In other words, Kant took pleasure in the negation of a primary pleasure, but in doing so still noted the terrors and horrible experiences of the sublime itself. Because of this, the empirical and transcendental barriers between these two worlds become stressed, and even something like purity itself stands as another form or name for annihilation. The outside finds its way in, and when it does, it delights us to death, bringing about ruination through the eroticism of the sublime, of which are two types, mathematical and dynamic, both containing within them catastrophic power. This is similar to the limit experience of Bataille, where we approach the impossible, ravaged and left to ruin. When looking at Land's descriptions of the sublime, he describes it in a way akin to Bataille's own terms, as something erotic, impossible, disastrous, devastating, intense, ruinous, sovereign, thanatropic, etc. Similarly, Land discusses the brutality of martyrdom as well through some horrific examples, but shows how they contain within them the essence of the spiritual. Again, this mirrors Bataille's own idea of the sacred being linked to the sacrificial. This sublime pleasure and a general sense of catastrophic delight is, of course, to land linked to capitalistic accumulation as well. Thus we see the links between Kant's noumena, capitalism, and destruction through delight, where the horrors of the sublime can be heard echoing ecstatically in the palaces of reason itself, out from the depths of its own hellish and nightmarish dungeons. Unlike pious and saintly Kant, who would have us believe to give up the violent and animalistic hell in favor of the sublime and sacred graces of the angels outside of experiences, Land shows that if one has the stomach, we can see how the two are inseparable. Destruction is necessary for any construction to occur. Though a moralist may try to slay the empirical and animalistic imagination and tell you of the Christian pleasure attained through a martyr's pain, it is not so easy to separate our deathly shadows from our feet when standing under the light of Bataille's excessive sun. Now, our current society would not agree with Kant's position for pain, nor does it go to the way of the Tao. The Western world is one of annihilating death and destruction, stemming from ruinous passions and intensities. As we brought up with Bataille, delight is the fuel that drives us toward death. We must not be cowardly moralists. We need to explore this death, for we have yet to know what death of this nature can truly do or produce. We must enter into this heart of darkness, or apocalypse now setting. Remember, this death drive is not a depressive or suicidal impulse, but merely a dissipation of intensities linked to the chaotic zero, the catatonic schizo, the empty body without organs, deterritorialization, Dionysian materialism, and a place populated by werewolf rat poets on par with Rimbaud and George Trakel. Rimbaud, of course, whom we've discussed previously in relation to Bataille and the thirst for annihilation, dealing with ecstatic points of intensity that approach the impossible, as noted in his work, A Season in Hell. As we head into Conrad's Heart of Darkness, we will howl under the moon, the egg, the body without organs, in an act of becoming as if we were several deadly werewolves at once, lost in Trachel's lunacies, eaten away by ecstasy to the point of ash. Indeed, artists are those savage beasts who can never ever seem to get enough. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, keep on delighting yourselves to death.